Thank All right, so uh, okay. this is just an update from the Unmet Needs Committee, um, a work session for us to, to work through um, some of those planning pieces with the eviction process now that the moratorium is being lifted um, from the eviction due to the COVID pandemic. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Janine McGee. She's um, the lead on recovery and our directors of human services. And so she will lead us through this, uh, this work session and draft plan. So Janine, it's all yours. Yes. Thank you. So let me know if any time you have trouble hearing me or if I'm breaking up. Um, I did put on screen share um, a draft of the plan. So this is pretty rough. I think we'll need a lot of input, particularly from Chris Floyd, since she has um, done something similar. And I know there could be some um, implications in all of this. So this is just, again, a draft. Um, we are open to suggestions and um, want to make sure this is going to work for all parties involved. Um, so feel free to um, give input, um, keeping in mind that we want to try to get something rolling. We are continuing to take requests for assistance right now, um, but we only have $14,000 left and a chunk of that is dedicated to folks who worked in Eagle County. Um, so we are running out of the existing funding um, to be able to meet needs for folks who are requesting September rent. Um, we have funded some September rent assistance, but um, we'll, we certainly expect we'll be seeing more. Um, so essentially the program works as a way to prevent, to provide rent assistance to prevent eviction. So the funding is only for rent, um, not for utilities or for any other costs um, and the goal is to work with the landlord to pay an adjusted rate over um, upcoming months to prevent um, that eviction process and um, I'll talk a little bit more about how we come to that adjusted rate and um, just a little bit of ideas about it. Um, we got to talking as a group and um, you know, it just depends on how much you all want to put into this. We could easily uh, spend $100,000 in paying three months rent for folks through October. And depending on what happens with the ski season, folks may need not as much um, or they may continue to need some assistance. So you all can think about what that looks like or if you would want to just jumpstart it um, with some funds and, you know, see how it's going. Um, I think a good way to do that in terms of process might to be uh, put it into the community fund, um, or you could um, have crystal cut checks to the agencies that pay the landlords. Um, that's a little more bulky and cumbersome. Um, so it might be easier to just do a chunk at a time into the community fund. But I think if I'm not mistaken, the CARES Act funds have to be spent out by December. So um, it's not enough to have given the money to the community fund, but we have to actually spend it out. Um, is that correct, Kayla? Sorry, I had to unmute. Yes, that's correct. All right. Hey, so Kenny, this, that this amount you all can figure out. Yeah, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna say, you know, in terms of, of kind of the, the logistics and process, we already have an unmet needs committee in place uh, that's done great work. If that yeah. committee's willing to continue, that seems like the logical play, the logical, um, you know, system to keep in place uh, yeah. to make this yeah. work. And so that's what we thought too. Um, so that's sort of how this structure is set up. Um, and you're right that uh, this, this is how it would work. And what we do in the Unmet Needs Committee is we meet to approve all of the requests and then we divvy up who's gonna actually cut the checks. Um, primarily it's full circle and build a generation doing that right now. Um, so so yeah, that that's how we structured this. So um, the next piece of that is that the tenant would work with the caseworker to evaluate what their income is and what's the likelihood of going back to work or if they just started back to work is there something they can contribute towards the rent 
Um, so that's part of what they figure out with the caseworker before they go into um, the conversation with the landlord. So essentially the conversation happens between the landlord and tenant. Everybody agrees on the amount um, and, and how many months rent is gonna get paid. And then step number five is the documentation agreeing to all that. And this is where Chris, we need to get your feedback. Is this even a good idea for us to be negotiating this? What are the pros and cons of that? What documentation needs to happen? Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree that there has to be some some documentation. My suggestion would be, a, you know, an agreement that we could provide a template for help fill in between the landlord and the tenant, um, reflecting whatever terms they agree to. Okay. And I can okay. yeah, I can Great. work on that. In fact, uh, Commissioner Mudge had shared a link. Dola has actually started working on. Um, some templates for these type of documents so um, that that'll give us a jump start. And I've already downloaded those documents and, and looking at them. So um, it, it, that should be, that should be pretty easy to do. Janine, this is, this is Commissioner yeah, Mudge. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, um, part of, and I, I, I jumped to thinking about those long-term strategies to really change some of just the, the climate that our, our community members find themselves in. <laughs> but um, um, what part of this can we also kind of say, uh, what part of the process can we say, well, and I understand that the, sorry, the Unmet Needs Committee already probably does exhaust all other existing programs, right? That that folks may or may not be eligible yeah. for, and that's part of this. And and I also wanna say, I just wanna say too, I invited, although I don't know that her um, audio is connected yet, but um, Judy Gilkerson from the COG, we had a COG meeting today, and they were saying that, um, and I see Julie, is on here again um, from public health um, because the program runs through Julie, I believe, um, with the COD, the yeah. CDB. So those, those, I guess Lake County is really underutilizing that program with the COG. And so I invited Judy to join us and maybe not go into depth on that conversation right now, but it sounds like we, also need to, I mean, I, I want to support this and, and put CARES funding towards this, um, but I want to be sure that we kind of hit, you know, the bigger picture and make sure that we are utilizing existing resources and, and accessing programs. Hey, Commissioner yeah, Hedge, um, I should Hedge probably name. start with that. Yeah. Can, this is Stephanie with Full Circle. Can I just jump in real quick? <clears throat> um, so, yeah. so Full Circle's team is is doing. After July one, we sort of tr transitioned the Unmet Needs Committee to to live to be housed within Full Circle. So our team is doing a lot of the um, sort of the case management and resource navigation. So as as families apply, we go through a whole screening process to, to sort of assess the situation and, and what other resources they may qualify for. So Janine's team has had quite an increase in, um, in folks signing up for, for services that they either didn't know about or didn't know they might qualify for. Um, so, so that's been a successful sort of partnership and referral. And then we're also working with with FERC and Salvation Army and a few other resources um, as we learn about different, re uh, different resources available. Um, and our staff are really trying to coach families up on all the different things that are available. And the unmet needs really is, um, Noah's described as like the safety net of safety nets. Um, so it really is sort of the, the last resort for a lot of folks. Um, and, and we will absolutely continue to, to try and um, <clears throat> use other resources and connect folks to other 
other places like the, the funding through the COG, um, there's just a lot of requirements within that funding that just doesn't meet um, some of our community members where they're at. And with this particular um, uh, proposal that Janine's walking us us through, we're really talking about, I mean, $100,000 is, is a big number. And once we start really breaking that down um, by multiple months rents for how many families we can serve, you know, we're, we're only looking at really a handful of families, maybe, um, you, you know, 25 to 35 families. Um, and, and that would be very, very targeted and intentional um, to serve families who really don't have anywhere else um, to turn in order to uh, avoid eviction. So I just wanted to kind of give that, give it a little bit more context and happy to answer questions. Yeah, Julie, do you want to talk for just a sec about the CSBG funding? there Janine did you say Julie or or Julie did you say Julie or Judy I did could you talk about Julie you. Julie me okay yeah I wasn't sure I was like did she yeah, say Judy you. I didn't know if you were Judy Gilkerson was gonna do it okay so we have two we have two forms of two funding streams of the CSBG um, fund some that are COVID related and some that are not, which we have re received referrals for the ones that are not related and been able to help with a bit. Um, there's some COVID ones that are under the CARES portion that also have to be spent out by December. I still have $8,589 left in that. Um, I asked that some of the um, round fours that we had on the unmet needs committees that if they weren't going to approve there to send them to me have never received any though um, but it's still available and then um, restrictions on the COVID cares ones are not as much as the ones I mean it opens up a little more than the one the regular one so I'm not sure what other details you so, want at this time. Could you talk a little bit about okay. who qualifies for each of those? Just overview. For the COVID one? Um, yeah, yeah, for the well, COVID one and the yeah, radio. Okay. So on the COVID one, that one obviously has to be COVID related and we can go up to 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. And let me just grab something. So these funds, of course, are tracked separately than our regular CSBG. And we can spend up to $1,500 on each family or individual. The funds can be used for rent, mortgage, utilities, dental, daycare costs, medical appointments gift cards for groceries or motel and hotel. So that is a lot broader than our regular CSBG. And again, there's the deadline of December 31st, so. And do those need to be legal permanent residents or citizens for that? Yeah. Yes, that's still a requirement. Okay. And then regular CSPG, how much do you have, is that 5,000 that you have in that? Or we spent some of that? Um, in regular CSPG, I still have $6,621. And that one, also legal resident of the US. Um, they, of course, in both aspects, they have to fill out the application and complete. And on the one, on the regular CSPG, it is a once every five years qualification. If you're approved, it's once every five years. Where on the COVID one, obviously, that one applies to now. So if in the past you have, a uh, client has received from the regular CSPG, if they're now affected by COVID, it's um, 
if approved again with the rest of the qualifications, they can qualify for that one. Um, but they do have to show some sustainability. That's one thing that is a requirement on. So they have the to show that they're going to be able to pay rent in future months, right? Yep. Yeah. And that's a and huge. And do they one. need to have been a resident of the county for a certain period? Sorry, you went in and out. I didn't hear all of that. Can you repeat, right. please? They need to be a do they need to be a resident of the county for a certain time period to qualify for that one? That used to be a qualification, but it's no longer on there. Um, so um, they should, as long as they're a resident of the county, but not necessarily for a, um, a period of time. It used to be six months. Now I don't see that. Judy can correct me if um, I'm missing something on that. Is there anything else you do wanted to add to that as a resource or? And we can do rush rent requests when it's eviction status, we request, you know, that the check be issued as long as all the um, application is complete and I have all the documents because we need copy of ID, um, other required things for the application. And as long as we have everything, we can do a rush request with um, Tara and, you know, as long as she's able to get everything signed, we're able to get it to the landlords, um, usually same week. So the turnover is pretty good, pretty quick. And we have a good relationship with a lot of the landlords in the area, so. Oh, it's great so, to see. Um, another funding source is DOLA. Mm -hmm. What, Julie? No, thank you. It's just good to see that the um, Unmet Needs Committee is um, following a lot of the same rules and getting the W-9s, which is helpful, and um, it just prevents a lot of, you know, backtrack, so. Thank you. Um, so Dola is another source, and Kaylee let me know that the governor just announced today he's going to send some more housing money um, through Dola out to the community. Um, the last round of funding that went through DOLA went through an agency out of Denver called Brothers Redevelopment. Um, and they have a process for application. Um, it's a pretty extensive process, so people usually need assistance filling that out. Uh, and it does require that somebody's a legal permanent resident. So it could be that this new funding will go through that same um, process uh or there may be another avenue i'm not sure but we'll wait to see there haven't been any details related to that um initially folks also qualified for disaster tana so we would send them through that process if they qualified for that first um and that's for children uh uh households with children um uh, making less than seventy five thousand, and somebody in the home's a legal permanent resident um and the other source, so as Stephanie mentioned, FERC, um, we had a few folks go through that process. So we've tried to keep on track with all of what's out there and send folks um, into the tracks that fit the uh, funding um, that meet, you know, sort of their situation. So, you know, for some folks, if they worked in Summit County, there was a funding source for a while. If there were folks that worked in Eagle, there's a funding source. If people worked in, um, you know, in in or lived in Lake and worked over there, that counted. So we're trying to sort of see where people fit and then making sure that there's something available for folks who don't fit any of that criteria. The other thing we closely evaluated was whether folks were getting unemployment, whether they were getting um, stimulus checks, whether they were getting disability or so, you know, we looked at, you know, everybody in the household's income and uh, what all those pictures look like. So we would continue to do that um, in this process and see if there's any contribution that the household can come up with. Um, and then the next step would be outreach to landlords. Um, and what we thought of was 
taking the agencies who've been working with some of these landlords who Julie mentioned, she may know them. Um, you know, we may know them through human services, build a generation or full circle may know them. So we thought we'd pair up an agency person who's worked with the landlords and an elected official um, and, and create a team of two and then break out the list of landlords that we have and assign a team um, to every landlord. So for example, if the landlord owns properties in the city, that makes sense for the mayor to be on, on the list for, to work with that landlord, partnered up with a person from an agency who's worked with that landlord. Um, and the agency would be the first one to make the contact and say, hey, remember us, we're the ones who've been paying you. <laughs> Um, and we've been working with you and have this relationship with you. Here's this initiative we're coming up with. We'd have a sample script and then we would let them know, hey, you're going to be getting a communication from, you know, maybe Commissioner Rudge or the mayor and let them know who you're working with. Um, and you're going to hear from them and they're going to tell you a little bit more about it and ask you for some commitment. So then the next step is this elected official reaching out by, um, phone call and probably an email or a letter confirmation explaining the program and asking the commitment from the landlord um, in this communication both in a script and the email and the letter we want to reiterate several things and make it really tailored to that particular person so we want to we want to identify the dollar amount that we have paid them um, during this time explain to them how this is going to benefit everyone that we run out of existing funding and a way to continue and make sure that everybody gets made whole as much as possible is to do this negotiated rate, um, prepay them for a few months and, and keep everyone from getting evicted, but also keep property owners expenses covered um, and stretching that dollar as far as they can. Um, and you know, depending on how we want to word this and finessing it, that they can choose not to do this, they can choose not to negotiate this point, but if they do choose to go through the eviction process and end up in court, the courts are likely going to require some mediation. Of course, we would definitely work with um, Chris and Judge on, on Seamus on that to sort of evaluate how we word that. Thoughts? I thought wait, I'd stop right there and just get a sense of like, what are thoughts up to this point about this team structure and communications or questions or suggestions? This is Greg. I, I really like the way you've approached this. Um, I think it will be effective. Uh, as we know, we can't make a landlord do anything. That will be, that'll be rule number mm -hmm. one as we, as we go into these discussions. So we have to be very gentle in our, in our approach to this. But I think that I think we'll get their attention, especially if we're willing to pay let's say two months or three months in advance at the negotiated rate, 75%, whatever we decide is, is going to be appropriate. Mm -hmm. I, I have mm -hmm. a feeling that we'll get, we'll get a positive response. I, I talked to a friend this weekend who has about 50 uh, properties in Greeley, uh, Greeley and Longmont. And I was kind of explaining to him what we were doing. And he said, that would really get my attention. And so I was, I was uh, encouraged by his, his response as a landlord that he felt like what our approach was probably pretty solid. Great, great. Um, um, the next step would be to have, did you have a question, Sarah? No, I'm sorry. I was just gonna echo the mayor's comments, but the kids were starting to yell, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a question. I, I, I appreciate that. And I think it's going to go a long way in, uh, in uh, the joint effort. And, uh, you know, again, towards to those long term strategies. So thanks. To Sarah's point, yeah. and, and yours, Janine, I, I would like, I would like to see some some sort of a statement or commitment from the courts that they are going to go to mediation, that that is going to be uh, their process. You're breaking to to up just a little bit, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I hope that this is clear. Uh, I'd like some sort of a statement from the courts that we can present. I think Am I still breaking up? 
Hold on, I uh, think we're missing what you're saying. There. I can you. I can hear you. I can hear you clearly, Greg. Janine, I'm not sure if it's just on your end. Anyway, look, uh, Sarah, maybe you can interpret for me. Um, <laughs> um, I, I would like to see some sort of a statement from the courts uh, that their process will be to go through mediation because the landlords are not going to want to do that because they're going to end up with, with, this, with you know, uh, either the same outcome or worse. And uh, so that may give us a lot of, lot of firepower. And Greg, this is Chris. Um, we did speak with uh, Judge Seamus about that, and uh, the county court, his standard procedure is if a, um, a forcible entry um, request is filed that uh, he does require mediation. It is automatically referred to mediation. So I don't think there'll be any issue with us representing Okay. You know, to, to the landlords that if you choose not to go through this voluntary process then, and file in court that you will be subject to mandatory mediation anyway. So why that, not work yeah. to resolve it before you expend the time and the money to file in court? That's great because I wouldn't want to misrepresent the courts if we use that. So I'm curious, Chris, if they end up in court and they go through that mediation process and they've had these upper other opportunities to sort of settle and negotiate, who pays the cost of the mediator? Typically with mediation, it's um, supposed to be split by the parties, but in a lot of situations with court ordered uh, mediation and especially with landlords, I've seen it to where um, they will they will ask the landlord to bear that expense because knowing that the tenant's yeah. unlikely to. But in this instance, there's really not an expense because the core of mediators the county court uses are all volunteer. So there's no no actual expense oh. to either of the parties to go through the mediation. Oh, okay. um, the problem with it, though, too, is a lot of times, you know, the the landlord won't participate in good faith in mandated mediation. So one of the hooks there uh, that Jonathan's explained that he, he will use in this instance is if they've been offered the opportunity to participate in this program, in the, the initiative, and they refuse, and then it's not settled in mediation, one of the things he's gonna remind landlords of is that they have a legal obligation to mitigate their damages. So if they, they refuse to accept a good faith offer that will you know, effectively net them probably more than they will get um, through the FED process, then he, he is going to, yeah. to tell them that that will essentially be held against them. And the way it works with mitigation of damages, if, if for example, they're, they're made an offer through this program of a specific amount and they refuse it and it gets into court, the judge can turn around and say, well, I'm going to, to debit what you're asking for by the amount that you were offered. So it definitely enhances the incentive for them to participate in the program. Great. That's, that's a good incentive. <laughs> um, in in um, conjunction with outreach to landlords is outreach to the community, um, sort of the community as a whole and then also to tenants. Um, Sorry, this is supposed to be a community. Um, so the outreach to the community would be a press release, you know, maybe some nice uh, media coverage, um, how, you know, we're all working together on this. It would be great to, if there is a landlord or two who'd like to be interviewed, there may be a tenant or two who's received assistance who'd love to talk about that, you know, an elected official, you know, really just an all around um, perspective. And then putting up flyers, places where people will see it as much as possible, not just relying on um, print or social media. We thought about coming up with some kind of a, you know, community slogan or message, um, you know, don't pack up, don't leave, give us a call, um, don't give up. Um, and then connect them with the caseworker from there. Um, we know that the Spanish speaking community tends to listen a lot to the radio station out of Eagle County. We found that out through this process, so that could be helpful. Um, Caseworkers checking in on existing clients they're working with and continuing to be available and by word of mouth, community agencies, and also letting landlords know um, that this resource is available to them. 
And then we've talked about getting some videos out, um, you know, on Facebook and some other areas where people know that they have options and they have choices. If they get an eviction letter, if they get a late notice or a warning letter, not to get intimidated by that, but, you know, give us a call. Let us try to see if we can work something out in this case. It, um, see, this, is, this is Chris. One thing well, I was going to suggest yeah, um, in terms of information that might be available, might be helpful for landlords too. If we could prepare like just a one page um, sheet or something, you know, talking point sheet to give the landlords and also something that they could in turn give to their tenants, you know, because part of the concern is yep. if the tenants yep. miss the opportunity, you know, don't hear about this, to have the landlords actually give them the information they need to, to help apply for, for resources. Yes, and you know, even during this process, we did have a few folks, a few landlords do that. Um, I think, I know for sure at one point, um, like Tabor Grand was putting flyers on their tenants' doors, um, just letting them know that there was resources available in the community. Um, but we're, we're hoping that that kind of thing would uh, continue, um, getting the word out, making sure that there are those resources available. And then I didn't add it to this, but then the other thing that we talked about was let emergency shelter um, recognizing that there may need to be some um, emergency shelter hotel stays provided when needed um, for folks who are evicted or come to town and don't have a place or you know whatever that looks like. Uh, one other thought I just wanted to mention before I forget, Chris, um, when we were talking about the list of landlords and creating this team process and just saying, well, what do you think the response is going to be? You know, which landlords are going to be the ones that are sort of excited about it? Which landlords are going to jump in? Which landlords don't want to talk to, you know, to someone? Um, and for whatever reason, I mean, they may be, you know, not local, not connected or whatever. And we sort of envisioned, and this is just a hypothesis, it could be wrong, that the larger corporate offices are going to be a little bit harder to, um, to get a hold of the high level folks who can make the type of decision on this and give the authority for this type of negotiating. And maybe they'll be, maybe they'll give that authority to their management team. I don't know. Um, Right now, Mountain View doesn't have a, you know, a, a frontline property manager in place, but maybe they'll authorize um, other folks to do that. We also envision, you know, folks like Eagle's Nest owned by a corporation like Wheelhouse, that could be really hard to get through. So all we have to do, I would say, is make those attempts. If we can say that we've made the attempt, we've documented this, we've sent them letters, we've tried to make sure that they knew about this opportunity and they were aware of it, and then still didn't take advantage of it, then when they um, try to go through that eviction process, that may be what gets their attention. Yeah, well, um, and so any other thoughts, questions? It, yeah, one, one thought on that um, thing too, is when it comes to corporate um, landlords, um, they can't be represented mm -hmm. in court without an attorney. So part of the incentive there too is, you know, they, mm -hmm. they may try to send their property managers, but their property managers can't represent them in court or that would be unlicensed practice of law. So that's part of the, what you want to put in the information okay. you sent out to landlords to essentially tell them that if, if your okay. property, if your rental property is owned in some sort of a, a legal entity, whether it be corporate or otherwise, you, you know, they may need to, they may be required to engage legal counsel in order to pursue the court proceedings, the court eviction. And that's another incentive to, you know, encourage them to take advantage of this program to avoid the cost of lawyers, which I will say painfully that that's not always a cheap endeavor. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but, but I think that's part of the incentive here. Yeah. Yeah. I have an additional question for Chris. Legal. Chris, um, in the mediation yeah. process, can they send them back to us as as part as as part of mediation? 
you know, that's something that I think would be better presented to Judge Seamus. I think his answer would probably be yes, if we can figure out a way that doesn't, it, it, it wouldn't have to be, it, it would almost be like the referred mediation to where they'd have to, you know, if they come back as part of the, you know, the dispute resolution, instead of just calling it mediation as part of the dispute resolution, the court could say, you know, I'm going to continue this until you have the opportunity to explore, you know, the unmet, me unmet needs committee program and, you know, mediation before we proceed. But I don't think it would be a situation where I don't think the court can order the landlord to participate in the, the initiative. Interesting. Well, the reason I ask is if, as, as was pointed out, if we go to a corporate landlord and they won't give us the time of day, uh, then the mediation process could encourage them to come back to us and finish that negotiation. Absolutely. Yeah. And, abs and I would expect as part of what I would hope would be some sort of uh, training for the mediators. And, and in speaking with uh, Judge Seamus, you know, he is absolutely ready and believes that the mediators that he has um, that participate in the mediation program for the um, FED cases would be more than happy to participate in this program as part of that because he said it's, it's an underutilized program anyway. And, and especially if we're able to set it up to where, you know, some of those volunteers who aren't local could participate virtually in the process then that will give them a, a, a an enhanced opportunity for their volunteer work. And also part of the mediation, you know, part of the mediation process is to explore avenues for resolution of the dispute. And this is clearly going to be one avenue. So I, I think in the mediation, it the mediator is absolutely going to bring up the availability of this program and encourage the landlord to come back and use it. Yeah. Sarah, are you talking? Sarah Mudge. Uh, I, I, uh, on the, just a quick note on the last point of the uh, emergency shelter um, funding proposed or request, yeah. I, I, I think that I'd like to talk about um, or include in that um, maybe an enhancement or expansion of kind of the Meals on Wheels and touching, you know, having, having some sort of uh, check-in with folks, even if they may not be quarantining, um, but expand that a bit or, or enhance what is already happening um, at the senior center so that um, maybe folks can spend even just a little, a little more time <laughs> with a, with a uh, kind of welfare check-in. But beyond seniors too, I mean, I mean, if you have families or whatnot, whoever might request that, perhaps. Um, I also wonder how. What have we learned about, um, you know, the utility pieces? Uh, pr primarily, I'm thinking of in the in the uh, mobile home parks, um, and if if we haven't. Uh, tried to solicit information specific to that. Um, maybe that could be a part of that that um, team outreach. Um, I know you had asked about this before, Sarah. It would just remind me specifically what your question is. Was it related to Excel and propane or rates? I think, or I'm just trying to remember exactly. I think more like the about. propane or and or the water in the water systems that are managed and the distribution systems that are um, specific to the, the parks themselves. And, and what, what, um, what are tenants, uh, um, what are they, you know, what, what fees or circumstances are they forced to uh, pay or abide by? And I know that there's some of that that's been addressed in the new um, oversight program. And maybe that's, maybe that's part of it. Maybe that, maybe we just need to um, all better understand, you know, what, 
kind of resources and opportunities that new program allows us so that we can, you know, best be armed with, uh, with information for folks and to respond. I'm wondering, um, Stephanie, do you have any thoughts or information on that? Stephanie Cole? She's available. Yes, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm totally clear on the, on the question. Like, so we, we have for propane was a, a big concern early on um, when COVID first hit because we were um, seeing a lot of families facing really large bills. So when the committee, when we were first getting started, we'd say, okay, we can cover one month of utilities. Um, and then all of a sudden the, we'd find, you know, we, we learned that families have to pay $500 to be able to get their propane tank filled. Um, and we're living without any kind of heat, um, you know, when it was still snowing in March and April. So, but we've, we have sorted that out and we, we're, we work with most of the propane companies now who are willing to come and do a fill and then give us the invoice, which for a lot of, in the past, like they have to, families have to pay up front before the, the companies will come and fill up the tanks. Um, so we've been able to work that out. Um, I don't have any updates on the, the, I know there were some water quality concerns. Um, I, if, if anyone from public health has updates on that, I, I, I don't, don't. Can I, um, there's not water quality concerns. Anytime somebody says that it like triggers this whole chain of events that doesn't need to happen. There's like a distrust of the water and there have been um, some like rate hikes in the past or like um, people have gotten really high water bills that we haven't seen that happen. Um, through the Unmet Needs Committee, because um, water is included in rent. Um, so the rent invoice that we received to make payments shows the water bill as well. Um, and and at least the payments that Builder Generation has made um, haven't seen like any anomalies. I would assume that, that's, um, that those practices are specific to the property managers and the maintenance crew. Um, and there's like pretty high turnover um, in those positions. So um, at least with the previous manager who just left, um, that, that hasn't been an issue. Um, and this is Gloria, and I'd just like to piggyback on that a little bit, just having um, been the property manager at Mountain View myself for um, a few years. So a lot of times the reason that um, tenants get those high water bills is because there's some sort of maintenance issue. Um, so like their toilet might be um, leaking, or you know, water faucet, um, and so again, just for, from that perspective, having dealt with that a lot, um, a lot of tenants have the misconception that they're getting overcharged when um, there's like some maintenance that the home might need, um, and that's why you know, like just slowly, their house is using up a lot of water, um, and then broken water pipes pipes in the winter time um, is a big one that ramps up the, um, the bill sometimes where like the tenant might have had some sort of maintenance um, in their home to complete and they're not able to do it. But, um, you know, so if they have like a, a water uh, pipe that is in their home that needs to be fixed, that impacts the whole mobile home park. And so a lot of times the uh, mobile homeowner has to fix it up for the, for the tenant, even if it's not the mobile home, um, owning the mobile home, like the, you know, then it ruins like um, the main line. Um, and so those are bills that we also saw that, you know, tenants might have had some um, water pipes freezing in the winter time, but the mobile homeowner had to um, hire the maintenance crew or hire a plumber to fix that. And so they'll add that to the tenant's bill. That is as helpful, thank you. 
Yeah, we paid for quite a few of them. I don't know that it was any more than what a typical propane tank would be would cost. Um, you know, it, I think it ranged between three hundred and maybe four four fifty at the highest or so to fill it. Um, we did see Excel bills, but I think that's not uncommon for see, people who work seasonally to um, you know save up. Uh, and and pay off the Excel bill at the end of a season, um, or the fact that Excel can't shut off electricity during the winter time, and then um, they'll work out payments to be made, you know, over the warmer season. So I don't know if your question is more like, are they getting charged higher rates, or you know, the average bill amount? But but yeah. I mean, I think all of the above, and the, but that's a lot of helpful background there. And um, curious if any of that has kind of been tempered with the new oversight program, but also gives me, you know, a thought of if we're talking about long-term incentive programs for large property managers or owners, um, you know, maybe there's something that we can do to speak with them um, and encouraged to do a, a full, uh, you know, preventative maintenance assessment of and, and get that work done before winter um, to do as much. And, and maybe that happens. Um, it's just spurring some ideas. I think, yeah, I think just in terms of the bigger picture, I think you have um, sometimes older housing that's not in the most optimal condition and um you know ideally if folks could have you know newer well-built housing that um would be less susceptible to some of those um heating or um other issues um and if there's a way that you know for them to communally share those costs and um spread those costs out i think it would just be you know require sort of an overhaul of the whole picture of it um and doing an assessment of you know where where costs happen i do know for example we helped a tenant or two who were in mobile homes that really were not inhabitable um any longer but they were just trying to make it work the mobile home park was trying to make it work costs were really expensive um and you know, sort of just sort of tenable, tenable, tenable living situations. That ideally, if we were, I think, to look at what it would cost to fix that, um, might be a good investment. So, with the structure, also, I, um, I mean, sorry, yeah, to interrupt. So another, um, you know, a population that I think that really struggles in the mobile home parks are. Um, single, single moms, um, especially with those maintenance yeah. issues, um, you know, and a lot of moms that work um, making very little, right, and cleaning jobs um, that sometimes are not even like 40-hour jobs, but just working here and there, um, and so that does tend to be, you know, a challenge in terms of Fix it, like getting your home ready for the winter. So um, again, from my experience, having been the property manager at Mountain View, um, I think that, you know, the, at least when I was working there, that owner would always, you know, try to encourage the tenants to have their mobile home ready for the winter and um, prevent, you know, like water leaks and frozen water pipes. But that's really hard to do when you have a small income. Um, and so, again, that's one of the things that we saw, you know, the people that can do it and can um, can invest in their mobile home to fix it up and um, weatherize it for winter, um, that's fine, but they, um, there's a really low, low, low income population over there um, in the mobile home parks that, you know, that um, it becomes like one challenge after another. This is Chris. I, along those lines, I was wondering if um, maybe C4 and the Lake County Home Builders Association 
might be able to partner or collaborate on some of that stuff um, to help out. Uh, you know, I, first thing that popped in my head was Habitat for Humanity, but most of the time their rehab projects are actually going into abandoned or, you know, dilapidated properties and fixing them up mm -hmm. for folks versus this. But I, I'm almost wondering if that's something maybe we could develop a partnership with C4 and the Home Builders Association to help with. I, I like that line of thinking, Chris. Well, I do I'm know like, C4 is concerned to outreach, so we could we could work on that as well. Yeah, and I, I can contact the Home Builders Association to see if they may be willing to participate. I'd like to, to kind of comment, uh, building on what Gloria was saying, uh, you know, we have to make sure when we implement this program uh, that we target populations. Uh, of, of need. And, and by that, I mean, we, we don't want to do a random lottery or a first come first serve basis. We want to target neighborhoods that, have, that are the most cost burdened. We usually think of those as a trailer park. That's not always true. We certainly have some cost burdened uh, um, populations within the city limits, but we, but we have to, we have to base it on need. And also income is another targeting uh, different industries, a ski industry, is a is a is an industry right now where people are either unemployed or will be underemployed uh, in the near future. And the last one is is kind of COVID nineteen risk factors, whether it's older populations or underlying uh, health issues. We have to think about those things as we look at at um, applications. And and um, I but I. Actually, I think that our Unmet Needs Committee is all over this, so I don't, I don't know that I'm telling you anything you don't already know and, and practice. And the second thing I'd like, I'd like to ask, you know, we, we've, we have this, this program put in front of us and it looks very workable. Um, are the county commissioners and the city willing to commit money from the CARES Act funding to this? And, and of course, we have two, two county commissioners on the line Kayla, were you going to say something? I was just going to, I was just going to dovetail off what what Greg had said, and I don't think that, um, at least from the conversation we had last week, I don't feel like there's any doubt that we would have to committing any of our CARES funding towards this initiative. And Sarah, what do you think? She, she thinks the same, I think. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Things are popping up all over. I can't hit mute and the space bar is not working. Um, no, I agree. I agree. I, I think that, you know, this is something that we need to be sure to address in the short term. And again, though, um, you know, not losing sight of those long-term strategies and some of the other um, uh, components that uh, the city and county can can work on. Um, I think that the Home Builders Association and it would be a strong partnership um, directly, you know, utilizing resources and the expertise there. Um, there's, there's so many um, folks who belong to that who do charitable and, and contribute to, to, to a lot of work in the community that, that may have um, a lot of interest there. Um, yeah, I, I think. So I guess the, the additional question is, I'll just are, we, add, are, we, are we talking about an initial an, an initial obligation of $100,000? Does that sound like a good number to both of you? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know how, you know, Janine was talking about the I don't know how we'd break this up into the time frame, um, and is that hundred thousand dollars that will last? Is that the projection? Sorry, I'm rereading this. Well, 
50 to 75 yeah. to get through the end of the year. Um, so if you just take 19 example, plus was, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say you had, you had 19 say. some thousand in that other document for, um, yeah, the emergency sheltering. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we may need if we kind of expand or enhance the um, senior center programming to also reach out to to isolated individuals or be accessible for them um, in general. Um, but I'd, I'd be happy to consider a commitment to this in our next meeting, the allocation. Okay. And Janine, in what time frame do you need this this money actually in the bank? Stephanie, do you want it? Are you here? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? We have fourteen thousand now, but it is running really low. Um, if we could get it, and and I would say the best avenue, or we could talk logistics, but but if it were to go into the community fund that's how we typically when we do the unmet needs committee then we put the request to the community fund and they cut the check to the agency um right. we could either do it that way or we could do it in the county. okay so in terms of process let me ask kayla um the the county is holding the cares act funding right now can the county write that check um ba based on based on the next uh um uh, county commissioners meeting the next city council meeting next city council meeting is, is uh, next tuesday uh to get that commitment yeah i think i mean the cares act is based on a reimbursable um expenditure anyway so we would have to reimburse and then submit proof of payment in order to be reimbursed from the state for the cares act okay um so that's not a problem and, and the county shouldn't have a cash flow issue with us um making that uh, payment if we choose to do so okay. within the next week or so. Uh, then when it, you, is your next county commissioners meeting on Monday? No, we don't have one next week. We have one the following week. Okay. Then I'll take this to city council on Tuesday and gain city council commitment. And then, okay. you know, once, once we've all agreed then we can go forward. Okay. When when this is taken to council and then to the commissioners, um, would it be helpful um, to have any of us there or prepare anything for those presentations? Um, not really sure. That's a good question. I hadn't hadn't really thought that far ahead. Um, but it is coming up Tuesday, so maybe uh, no. Let me let me check the the. Uh, uh, let's, let's put it this way. The answer is almost certainly yes. Uh, some sort of presentation would be helpful, uh, however brief uh, it might be. Is that something you're willing to, to do? Or, or you could just, uh, uh, you know, volunteer someone else to do it too. <laughs> I was going to say, I think, I think council, I think it's always uh, helpful to uh, arm council with the all the information and kind of the ins and outs because these are people who want to understand that and promote it and support it um, and so I think I think giving them and reiterating you know all the all the highlights and points um, that we've been able to talk about and since we have um, had the board in these conversations that's not I would I would say that's not necessarily um, necessary for our meeting but I, I think knowing um, the council members, they would appreciate that. Then I will, I will forward to them uh, Janine's program as it's outlined yeah. here and, and uh, then uh, give them a little bit of written background, let them know that we will consider this on our agenda for Tuesday and that Noah will make a brief presentation. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Good to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think also logistically, the next step then is we will work on creating the teams um, and 
on putting together an agency person with an elected official, assigning them to some landlords, coming up with a script, an email sample, and you know, sort of what the letter will be. I heard Chris say that DOLA has some examples of those documents when we come up with negotiations. Um, I would like to see if we could maybe meet on this in particular um, next week and and between now and then we could get all of that out to everybody. So then by the time we meet, we can talk about how we're rolling this out. Does that sound workable to folks? Yes. Yeah. So what works for next week? This two o'clock next Wednesday, or would you prefer to do a, is that too, too soon or too well, late I, either way? I would say not at all because by then we'll know uh, what city council's uh, okay. decision is and that can be a, a jumping off point for us as well. Okay. Janine, Maybe it looks like- next yeah, it looks like Sarah Thanks and so I are um, free next Wednesday as well, so I can create an event or uh, create a ca calendar invite for her and I on that. Okay, and so in the meantime, we will work on getting teams put together and scripts put together um, and give you all an idea and probably reach out to each of you individually and give you an idea of you know, what that will look like and um, sort of who will be the point people for that. Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, next steps so that we keep it all straight, who's to talk to whom. And um, I think we'll just have to keep touching base. And I think after that initial outreach, um, if you all can just be prepared for, you know, some, some good PR, that would be great. Um, okay. And then we'll line, you know, what that could look like. We'll have a sample press release and then we can have um, the scripts and stuff and some of those details lined up for um, how we'll, how we'll negotiate this. And so um, once it's final, then, we can get all of that out to everybody. We don't want to get it out there until you all have agreed, you know, that um, for the runs behind it too. And then we can, we could start talking about, you know, who's going to talk to whom and see how that goes. Okay. Um, and I agree with Sarah's comment in the chat to talk with council about long-term strategies as well. Um, Mayor, maybe we can talk about that after we get this initially off the ground. I, I agree um, that there there are a lot of uh, a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Uh, this yeah. is this is one of many. Agreed. Well, so I, I would so appreciate. It. Yeah, thank you, Janine, for your work on this. This is um, great. I appreciate it so much. Um, I'll get a calendar invite. Uh, sent out and circulated with Zoom information for next Wednesday at 2. Um, it'll be the same Zoom information that we've used here today and um, make sure that it's on our calendar for next week as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I appreciate all of you being passionate about it and we don't have to spend a lot of time talking you into it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does anybody have anything Sounds else? Good. And any questions or anything for Janine? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. No, I don't have anything. Like this one. Um, part of that, I maybe will reach out to Janine just to make sure, you know, as we start to talk about longer term strategies that, again, that's something that opportunities are clear, or maybe we just go out with those partners to, and then as, um, you know, we can reconvene in this kind of group and, and figure out what, what might work best. Um, or then promoting yeah. some of those 
Um, but thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. And let me know. And Sarah, I'll follow up with you um, in a separate email about the um, information you're asking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Appreciate this. <laughs> Thank you.